So thank you guys again. Uh, this presentation is the challenges behind building envelopes. February 27, 2019. The learning objectives for today is to learn from, we have experienced panelists that went through um, two different projects and they have some details and specifics uh, that they would like to discuss. One of them is a building envelope repair at the U.S. Navy in Cutler, Maine, and another one was a curtain wall leak at Mass Medical Society in Waltham, Massachusetts. Some really cool pictures that go with the presentation as well. Um, in addition to, we can learn some of the warning signs for building envelope compromises, and then understand the approach to correctly solve the building envelope issues. The meet the panelists. So we have Steve Jones from Building Envelope Specialists. Uh, he'll be joined by Evan Barman and Ralph Dean um, from CCI Alliance Companies. And then we have Gretchen Barron from uh, Massachusetts Medical Society, and they'll just give a high-level intro when they start uh, their presentation. So moving forward, I want to hand it over to Steve to kick off on his project that he had with the U.S. Navy. Great. Hi, everyone. Uh, good afternoon. Um, uh, we did a project uh, um, underneath uh, CCI to uh, make sure that the Helix building, um, which is uh, in front of you, the photograph in front of you, um, was leak-free by the end of this project. And I'm going to have Ralph talk a little bit about the, pro the, the importance of this building and also the, the client. Next slide. Hi, this is Ralph Dean from CCI. A little bit of background on this contract. CCI was a prime. We do a lot of work with um, the, the Navy headquarters is in NAFAC for the East Coast for their construction and acquisition. They have a branch office at Portsmouth Naval Shipyard for PWD Maine, and they handle all of the contracts basically from New York City and north. Uh, this project was for NAFCOM Telcom as the, under, as the eventual underlying customer and bill payer, and the project was in Cutler, Maine. Extreme down east, um, about as far down east as you can get to stay in the U.S. So next slide, please. The project was at the North Helix house. You saw the picture, and you'll see a number more. Um, the whole campus up there for NAVCOM Telstay Cutler was built in 1961 on 2,000 acres of what was scrubby forest and blueberry barrens. Um, they have... The two helix houses there, one control center, a power plant, which is unbelievable, uh, providing all of the power to the, to the system, and a um, 26, 900 foot tall antennae to broadcast. The purpose of the building is to provide very low frequency communication to submerged submarines in the Arctic, the Atlantic Ocean, and the Mediterranean. Um, it provides secure comms. And as, a, as you can imagine, it's a key element in communicating with our ballistic missile submarines at sea and a key element of our deterrent, uh, nuclear deterrent. Um, it's considered a national asset, and it's one of only two in the world, and it's the most powerful uh, operated anywhere. Um, Steve's going to describe the building itself, which is one of the weirdest buildings you'll ever see in your entire life. If you go inside it, it reminds me of the movies you see about Frankenstein's, Dr. Frankenstein's laboratory, it's on, only on steroids. The thing is enormous. Um, it's also a weird construction. Steve's going to get into that in detail. The strangest thing about it is it's largely non-ferrous. The walls and the ceiling and the bushings and the, uh, the flashings and all the, all the fasteners are non-ferrous to provide insurance that there will be no electromagnetic interference with the building. When the building is powered up, there's so much uh, electromagnetic energy being generated that you cannot go in the building, you cannot go near the building. Um, you're literally just about fried if you do so. It's a, it's like a gigantic microwave if you were to go inside while it's in operation. That's all I have, and I'll turn it over to Steve to discuss the building and uh, so forth. Great, thanks, Ralph. Uh, next slide. So uh, what Ralph is describing, this is one of the very uh, ominous inside this building. It's, in, it's a non-occupied building. So uh, it's as cold in the inside as it is on the outside. And what you're seeing is a photograph that came off the web. We couldn't share any of our own photographs um, uh, that we took on site. So we, we have to actually get the things off the web. But 
this gives you an idea, and I think this is probably 1960s vintage, but this gives you an idea of, uh, of the equipment that's in there. If you take a look at this photo, there's the variometer is, is, um, is being held up by, um, by a, 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 it's almost like a staging, but it's made out of a very rare wood that comes out of, um, uh, I think it's Africa, right, Ralph? Well, so, um, and again, it has to do with this whole non-ferrous um, uh, construct. Um, so this is what it looks like. This is one of the pieces of equipment that's in that building. Next slide, please. And the building is shaped in, in a Y. And we're going to show you a, a photograph from Google Earth that gives you a better, um, better idea of what it looks like from the top. But at the base of the main building is the variometer, which as you just saw. And there's three bushings, uh, one at each uh, of the legs at the base of the, of the building that, fun, uh, that function as uh, conduit buses, busways that lead uh, uh, to towers that support the, the bushings and the quarters at the end. So um, this is what it looks like from the top of the building, looking at one of the bushings. Next slide, please. And this is what it looks like if you were sitting on a helicopter. So a couple of things I'll point out to you. The, the two ends of the Y, one is at ground level, one is at, the, at roof level. That tower in the, in the middle, take, take uh, close attention to that because the, perp, the reason why this building was leaked was largely related to that thousand foot tower that uh, sits right in the crotch of the Y. Um, in the winter, uh, ice develops on that tower and the ice chunks are in some cases as large as Volkswagen. This is the, the, the enormity of this building in its components is, um, is breathtaking when you first get on post. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, the, the structure, if you take a look at the building, again, this is like a 1960s photograph that we got off the web. A um, couple of um, uh, orientation points. Those large, um, almost U-shaped things at the top on the, on, on the top of these, these towers they're called ice shields. Those are to protect the uh, bushings. And if you notice, the rest of the building has a, an exterior steel skeletal system, which uh, causes some envelope issues. The envelope issues are related to that is there's, uh, there's um, uh, places where there are um, um, holes in the building to accommodate that, that, um, uh, that structure. Now, this is particularly damning in this particular area because of the very, very high winds that are on down East Maine. And um, we'll talk a little bit more about this later on, but you're talking about a building that is 76 feet high. And when you're talking about being at, on the coast of, uh, of down East Maine, there is some massive winds that, that this building is subject to. And driving rain ends up um, sometimes uh, entering in the beam penetrations. Um, and that was one of the problems. Next slide, please. So this is a photograph of the underside of the, um, the roof slab. The roof slab, uh, and this is, as you notice, uh, there's, there's a noticeable um, fracture in that roof slab. Again, uh, more, more to be told in the story, but this is what it looks like underneath when you're in the, um, the plenum or the interstitial space right below the roof deck. So the way that the roof was designed is you have a you have a, um, rubber pavers that are that were designed to protect the membrane. Then you have a membrane insulation. Then you have the the concrete roof deck and then a plenum underneath that. In the plenum space, there's a corrugated roof. Uh, there's a corrugated deck, and then below the deck itself is the aluminum ceiling that um, uh, is what you see when you go inside the building. Next slide, please. So I talked a little bit about the uh, structure of the, uh, of the roof. This roof was um, installed in 2012. Uh, and the problem with the, the, the uh, roof uh, we'll get into, but the bottom line is this is a roof that was the original roof that was put on there was put on, uh, basically they had um, railroad ties with uh, an asphaltic material that uh, protected from leaking. And the railroad, the railroad ties were these great big uh, um, wooden um, uh, pieces of protective material 
that actually protected the building from the ice as it, as it, as it fell onto the building. Um, and what the designers of the new roof system thought was that if you, they put these rubber pavers up there, that would be the thing that would be able to protect that membrane. But uh, you're going to see in a second that that really wasn't thought through as well as uh, perhaps it should have been. Next slide. I'm not going to read this slide. It is way too uh, in depth. Uh, but I did put the information up here because I thought it was important to understand. So, so you understood the uh, means and the, the thought process that went into the designing the wall system for this building. This is not your average building. This building uh, was designed to have non-ferrous material to uh, support its mission, which was uh, low frequency communication. So in order to, to produce uh, the, the results of what this building's mission was, uh, the wall system was very carefully designed to make sure that uh, the equipment inside um, was able to do its job and, uh, and really protect the, coast, the east coast of the United States. Next slide, please. Well, uh, oh, actually, this, yeah. is seven slide. Yeah. Right, this is Evan Barman with CCI. So who is CCI? We're a federal contractor. We do 99.9% .9 of our work for the federal government. Um, and we have three lines of business, really. We have a construction management business, an energy business, and a facility support uh, services business. We are an Alaska Native corporation. What that means is in the government's eyes, we are a disadvantaged business. So we are what is called certain status where we can continually keep our designations. And those designations are based on business size itself, where we have emerging small businesses, 8A companies, which allows the government to sole source us work. Uh, we have small businesses and we have large businesses. Uh, we're about 210 people right now. We're working in all 50 states um, and some territories. Next slide, slide please. So as our project role, we were the uh, prime contractor for this job here. Yeah, so we held the contract with the Navy itself. Um, and we, in turn, had direct communications with the client back and forth. And in some instances, the EF did speak directly with the client to help uh, move things along. We provided project management, site superintendent, health and safety, and quality control roles. And those are all very important roles within the government. They, uh, so it makes the project's very successful. Next slide. So uh, Building Envelope Specialist is a consulting firm that focuses exclusively on the building enclosure. Um, our services include uh, building enclosure surveys, forensic investigations, definition of scopes, uh, uh, definition of scope using architectural drawings, architectural sketches, and repair documents. We also do construction management, construction administration, and field inspections. For this particular project, we were involved, uh, we used, we did um, uh, uh, a building closure uh, survey. Uh, we did, we, we scoped out the repair through sketches, and we did on-site um, uh, evaluation and um, also inspections. Um, the, uh, role for BES in this project was to determine the deficiencies of the building, define the scope of repair, and conduct uh, construction inspections while the repair was going on, and uh, deliver building envelope surveys, uh, a survey report uh, to CCI and eventually NAPA. Next slide. Now, as well, Dean again. <clears throat> You're beginning to get a gist for the the structure of the uh, project team. CCI is a prime, BES is the subject matter experts on building envelopes, and our primary um, performance subcontractor was a company called CCB. They performed most of the work themselves. We've done a lot of work with CCB. They're a nice company out of Westbrook, Maine, and uh, owned by a lady named Beth Sturdivant. They had experience with us uh, from 2012 on the, on the, on the building, and uh, really did a nice job. They didn't subcontract out much of the second tier except for the scaffolding. Next slide, please. Post-award challenges really began pre-award 
um, the timeline on this thing is hugely compressed. We got the request for proposals from the Navy on the 5th of March. Um, and working with BES, CCB, and the Navy architect, we came up with our price proposal on the uh, 16th of March, less than two weeks later. And it was awarded. We came up with our formal proposal on the morning of the 16th, and they awarded it on the afternoon of the 16th. Almost unheard of for um, federal contracting. They had to do this because we had to be out of the building by late May, early June, in order for them to be able to reactivate the building in its communications mode, because they need to go to both buildings functional uh, for the summertime up there. Um, so in any event, we had a hard deadline. We had to get it moving, and the Navy did this contracting. We basically got a $1.2 million contract to fix the build, analyze and fix the building in less than two weeks. Next slide. So the, the challenges that we had at BES was the fact that, you know, normally what we'll do is we'll go in, we'll evaluate uh, the condition of the building, we come up with repair scopes. That re repair scope has been completely vetted out by our staff here, and then we, then we uh, supply the contractor with the repair scope to, to do the work, and then we'll do, um, we'll do inspections along the way. That's not how this project worked. So in this uh, particular case, we had to determine the problem and almost come up with a repair scope as we were going along because CCI and CCB uh, were, were tasked with making these, uh, these modifications almost as soon as we came up with what the problem was. Um, one of the other things that we, that we uh, experienced is that we had to do some water testing on the building and there's no water out there, so we struggled to get uh, sufficient water for water testing. The Navy had this re re really strange requirement for our IR scanning the building. And no matter how many times um, myself or someone from BES would say, look, there's no, there's no temperature differential there. Nothing is going to come up. Uh, they kept on you know, requiring us to do an IR scan, even when we, in some cases, could see the, the water in the roof system, they still required the scan. It's one of the things that we learned about working with the federal government. When it's a part of the scope, it's a part of the scope, and, and you, you have to perform those functions no matter what. Um, and then there was, uh, there was uh, you know, then we ran into unforeseen conditions where initially a lot of the pavers were going to move some of the pavers, uh, but we ended up having to remove, remove all of the pavers um, uh, in order to um, identify the problems. So when we assessed the roof, the first thing we did was we saw from underneath, there's another photograph of the, the, the roof deck. Um, you can see where there's rusting on the corrugated deck and there's also um, uh, cracks and fractures on the uh, concrete deck. And that's where we, we started to identify areas where water may be coming in through the roof. Next slide. When we re removed the pavers, the first the, we did find a couple that uh, that we we removed that that were right above where we saw water coming in. And remember, these roof pavers they were in pr pristine condition when we first went up there, so it was really difficult to figure out where that those leaks might be. Once we removed the pavers, uh, you can see one of the cracks that uh, were in the membrane uh, underneath the pavers uh, once we removed it. So the, there's a photograph of the pavers you can see at the top of the page. There's a slip sheet underneath the pavers to protect the, the roof membrane, the membrane, and then we have the, the, the uh, fracture in the roof. So the, uh, the reason for these fractures is large amounts of ice impacting the pavers. The pavers were protected themselves amongst, they were resilient enough to absorb it, but the, the, um, the force was translated through the pavers onto this brittle decking, uh, I'm sorry, membrane, and the membrane would crack. What we ended up finding was 31 cracks on that membrane. And when you looked at all the pavers initially before removing them, they were in pristine condition. So um, that's what our investigation uh, was able to uncover for the roof system. Next slide, please. The other, the other uh, deficiency we found in the building was because um, of how it was structured, there was a lot of beam penetrations. And you can see um, at the top of this sort of cornice that was hanging out, uh, there's some, some significant areas where driving rain can, can get into those areas and then find its way into the uh, very sensitive inside of the building where, where there was supposed to be 
uh, the builders were sort of supposed to be protecting these, uh, this equipment, but water was able to find its way in through those beams have a penetration and then eventually into the building. So uh, we had to come up with a way to close up all those penetrations. And um, that's what we did um, using uh, a, a system that the Navy was already familiar with using. Next slide, please. So this, the scope of the repair was, was a challenge also because you know we didn't have any time to draw details we didn't have the time to, to, to sketch things out the way that we normally did. What we did was we went into the field. This is a, this is a, a uh, uh, annotated photograph that we used as a detailed sketch to, to describe exactly how the, um, the beam penetrations were to be addressed in a repair. And as you can see, you know, basically what we did was just annotated the photographs and took photographs of a repair that we actually worked with CCB in the field to produce. Um, we were able to, to then you know, give them a sheet in order to, um, to accomplish the same type of repair on all existing conditions that were like this one or similar. And um, this is not how we normally do things, but in the, uh, because of the very compressed time, time schedule, we had, uh, we had to really think outside the box. And um, it worked very, very well. CCB liked the, uh, the details that we came up with, and we were able to employ those, and, um, and they were very effective. Next slide, please. In terms of the roof repair, what we, we did find an existing drawing that was, that was uh, produced, uh, was uh, provided to us through a PDF, and we were able to uh, identify every place there was a crack on the membrane and then put it onto this drawing, which we, which we uh, submitted to uh, CCI and then CCB. So, um, and we did that through field measurements and just identifying every single place there was a, there was a crack. We also, in the field, made sure that we used um, uh, masonry uh, chalk and we circled every single fracture and every single uh, deficiency in that roof, just to make things easier for the, for the uh, contractor. Additionally, we were there uh, working with the contractor to make sure that the Firestone repair, which was uh, outlined by the Firestone, uh, uh, by Firestone, was uh, installed properly. So we did multiple um, inspections uh, during the repair process. Next, next slide. This is Ralph Dean again speaking of the construction process. No construction project that I've ever been involved with goes like glass smoothly and this one is no exception we had some bumps um first one was with scaffolding um the scaff when we the cci ccb signed up the scaffolding company they said okay great we'll put you in the queue we'll let you know when we're going to mobilize we said no that ain't going to work i spent a day on the phone with them trying to convince them of the importance of this thing and they finally got it they sent in their badging request for their their um 12 man crew immediately um and almost immediately 10 of the 12 were rejected because they had criminal records, including the foreman. So <laughs> back on the phone, they got another another team of scaffolding guys to come on from way away. And they responded and they did a nice job once they got on the site. CCI had its own issues. We let our subcontractor use the wrong adhesive and the wrong procedures, but to seal up some of the seams on the outside of the building that caused rework. Um, that was CCI's QC. Uh, falling down in that case, but we worked through it and we uh, we kept the project moving. Hats off to CCB uh, for their flexibility in rolling with us. Next slide, please. So a part of our process is the Navy required us to do acceptance testing. Um, fortunately for us, there was a rainstorm on uh, uh, April 26th that um, after all of the patches were were completed, um, on the, the, the Firestone SBS roof system. Um, initially, the, the Navy said, well, we, we still have to do acceptance testing. And then we, uh, myself and Ralph, sort of made the case that, look, uh, acceptance testing has already happened. We had a rainstorm that we couldn't produce the amount of water um, artificially that the, that the rainstorm uh, produced, and there was no leaks. So um, that's, that's how we, we did the acceptance testing for the roof system itself. Uh, so we had a bit of luck there. Uh, next slide. 
all the wall penetrations uh, had to be also um, uh, tested. And uh, we did that. Um, CCI ended up uh, really engineering a way to get water at a high velocity of pressure up to this, these areas that had to be, um, uh, to be tested. So by the time we got to acceptance testing, we had the water issue completely uh, figured out. And what we were able to produce uh, for a result was, uh, was really no, no leaks. There were a couple areas where there was some, not leaks, but there was some weeping of water that, that came in through the flashing system that we had, uh, that had been installed, that we had designed. Uh, we were able to um, uh, make some modifications to those, those details and apply them in the field test them, and uh, in the end, there was, there was no leaks. Next slide. So BES uh, then went to uh, produce a report, which is way out of sequence for us, but uh, this report was very important because it was something that was gonna be observed in red uh, by uh, officials at the Pentagon. So uh, I didn't realize that at the beginning of this, and uh, you can imagine uh, the pucker factor that came in when I suddenly realized the report that we're writing is going all the way to the Pentagon. But in that report, we described uh, the repairs. We described um, uh, how the building envelope was constructed just from a reference standpoint. We also gave examples of how the building survey was, uh, was uh, conducted and an explanation, I should say, and then also a narrative that outlined the building deficiencies. The BES repair recommendations and the repair scope was also in the report. And um, along with that, we had uh, the results of the acceptance testing and the repair specifications that we get detailed in um, annotated photographs, we converted to uh, CAD drawings. The importance about that is uh, there's two buildings, as Ralph had mentioned, on this post. Uh, the South Helix building had, uh, had some of the had similar problems. So uh, these details will be applied to the South Helix building, I think, this year. So it was, uh, it was a good value to the Navy to have this report and all the reference material so that they can apply it um, on this other building. Next slide. This is kind of a closeout slide. Um, at the end of the day, the only thing that matters is that the client happy with the product. And uh, as Steve said, it's not just the NASPAC in this case. The, Results of the project went to the three-star admiral in charge of NAVCOM, TELCOM, all Navy communication. So it really was, was he gonna be happy with it? That's all that mattered. Um, the contracting officer for NAVFAC PWD Maine, at the end of it said this was an outstanding project and only CCI could have pulled it off. CCI has done hundreds of projects with NAVFAC. Uh, how did we manage this one? Number one was the speed. We could have speed because we had a flexible contract vehicle. We could make changes on the fly as recommendations and changes came up from BES and from CCB and in conjunction with the Navy. We also had the team in place before the project even came to the RFP stage. We had BES signed up as a subject matter experts, as a, you know, joined informally at the hip with CCI, and we've done many projects with CCB and they were ready to rock and roll. So the speed was number one. And the second one was trust. Okay, the Navy had to have faith in the team that we could make these recommendations. Navy could buy into them. And we could begin the repairs right away. They did that. So the result of the speed and the trust was we were perfectly agile uh, during a very compressed construction period. And we were able to wrap this thing up. Um, for many, many changes to the contract scope as we were doing all this, Navy let it fly, and at the end of the day, we had a contract modification to tie it all together, wrap it in a nice bow, and invoice final on the project. And um, it turned out to be a marquee project for CCI, and it's one that we're extremely proud of. Next slide. Oh, that's great. Thank you, guys. I appreciate uh, your insight, and I do just have a couple of questions, which I'll probably save for the the, the very end, and I'll transition over here to Gretchen. Um, one thing to think about uh, towards the end, I'm very interested in the decision-making process on um, the Navy and with some of the changes uh, that you guys had, and not to mention the extreme tight schedule, but I'll wait uh, for the end, and I 
Evan and Ralph and Steve, I appreciate your time. And the second half, uh, we're going to go over to Gretchen, and um, she has a similar building envelope story, different project, um, similar issues. So with that being said, um, Gretchen, I'm going to hand it over to you. There we go. I can hear oh, you now. There we go. <laughs> yep. Hi, I can hear you. Thank you. <laughs> All right. Um, so just to give everyone a little background, I am the director of corporate services for the Massachusetts Medical Society. We are the nation's oldest professional organization for physicians. So I like to tell people in our industry that we are the IFMA for doctors for the state of Massachusetts. We also publish the New England Journal of Medicine, um, which most people have heard of. And we um, occupy a 200,000 square foot office building in Waltham, Massachusetts, um, designed and built in 1999. Jung Brannon was the original architect and Leggett McCall was the um, developer of the project. In 1999, during the first year of occupancy, um, leaks were noticed in the atrium. Um, our facilities team brought in a number of glazing contractors over the years. None of them could seem to figure out what was wrong. Uh, when I came on board in 2012, we hired, we attempted to hire three different firms um, to analyze the curtain wall and figure out what was wrong with it. Two ultimately walked away. Um, it, it's a difficult site. There's some planters in our atrium which prevent lifts from coming into the building, which meant um, they couldn't get up to really analyze the inside of the building. Um, we luckily um, were able to hire Simpson, Gumperts, and Heger, and they um, did the report, which was completed um, and put an initial replacement cost at 1.1 million. Um, we work almost exclusively with Chapman Construction, so we brought them on board fairly early in the process to partner with us and do a design build. Um, during the initial report, um, these photos kind of show you what we were dealing with on every time it rained um, from various points in the curtain wall, we would have a decent amount of penetration. It wasn't unusual for there to be standing water on the bottom um, layer level of the steel. Um, and obviously anywhere tied into the building, we had considerable damage to our drywall. In 2012, we were actually concerned about the steel corrosion and whether that was impacting the structural um, integrity of the curtain wall. We had a um, long after the report was done, we had um, a long conversation, a big evaluation. We are a nonprofit and managed by a board of trustees. So we presented to them two options. One was to replace the curtain wall completely at 1.1 million and the other was to retrofit it um, with some seals, which we couldn't guarantee would actually solve the problem, but it was our best guess at how to fix it. We ultimately decided to replace the entire um, curtain wall. That, um, SGH was able to come up with a design that eliminated the problems. It, in large part, the curtain wall, because of its concave shape, wasn't maintaining the pressure seals around each pane of glass. There was also um, a design failure, if you will, and that there were these reveals between each floor, and those reveals were actually sloped inward. So once the water got into them, the water just sat there until it eventually went in through the wells and dripped down the inside of the curtain wall. So SGH designed a new method for hanging the curtain wall on the outside of the structural steel. Um, we did have to do some repairs to the structural seal, but for the most part, we were able to um, put the new curtain wall on the outside of the building. Andrew, if you can move the slide forward. Um, to go over some of the challenges, um, the first was when we actually went out to bid on the replacement of the curtain wall with Chapman, the price doubled. Um, when we looked at everything that needed to be done, which included painting, drywall repairs, replacing the carpet after scaffolding was erected, the final cost came in at 2.1 million. And for a nonprofit, that's a lot of money. So we were not actually able to proceed with the project until 2016. As I mentioned, we have a very large planter in our atrium and the layout of that planter prevents us from using any lifts inside. There's only three feet between the main entrance door and the planter. So everything had to be done with scaffolding. While that was ongoing, my building was fully occupied. Um, and we have sometimes on average 400 um, outside conference customers in the building, as well as our 400 employees. During construction, while the curtain wall was removed, 
our building was essentially open to the elements, um, which made controlling the HVAC a considerable challenge for my facilities team, but they managed to do it. Our security team who sits in the atrium <laughs> um, went down to having just shirt sleeves as opposed to their normal um, jacket and tie, et cetera. Um, but again, we did have an, a tremendous logistics plan because as you can see from the photos, our entire lobby ended up being scaffolded. We had to create essentially tunnels for staff to walk through to get from the elevators into the office areas. We took advantage um, of this opportunity to paint the ceiling. We, the original design had down lights all over the ceiling. Unfortunately, at 75 feet high, my maintenance team could never replace the light bulbs, so they had been burned out since basically the year 2000. We, we, based, we just removed them all and drywalled right over them, painted the entire area. Um, which allowed us to eliminate one of our bigger maintenance challenges, which was trying to deal with some water damage to the ceiling. Next slide. This is um, a pretty good example of what our building looked like for most of the summer of 2016. Our main entrance was completely closed off and the glass panels were missing from anywhere from five to seven bays of glass at any one time. Each night Chapman would drape curtain uh, like tarp curtains down to keep out the water, but the HVAC controls were almost impossible to maintain in the lobby. So it'd be quite warm, uh, as you can imagine, during the summer. Thankfully, uh, we had it in completely enclosed by the end of September, so we didn't have to deal with any winter weather. Next slide. So you'll see here the original design, which had those recessed horizontal bands. The water would actually sit inside of those, and then at each weld, it would creep inside the building. The design on the right is the new SGH design, which has proved to be completely watertight. We've not had any issues. Um, they just covered those with the spandrel glass and that has solved that part of the problem. They've also, by hanging the curtain wall outside of the structural steel, they were able to um, avoid using the same type of compression seal that we had previously, which had led to such significant failures. Yep. There's um for anybody that is on the line, if there are any questions, please feel free on the chat function uh, to send me any questions. Um, there's, I guess, hot off the press from Gretchen. Um, I guess it's the nature of our business on trying to do construction projects while in occupied buildings. What was some of the feedback, or I should say complaints, of people um, trying to get into the building while knowing the main entrance was under construction? Um, for the most part, our, we had some directional issues with our conference center customers, but we do have a dedicated entrance for them. So visitors coming to the building, Chapman did a fantastic job of exterior signage on the construction fences. We have other driveways that lead into our property, so they were able to um, direct folks as needed to those other, other entrances. Um, this entrance is not a particularly good entrance for handicap accessibility. So we didn't really have to deal with that because most of the spots um, for handicap access are actually at another entrance. But for the most part, we did a lot of uh, sort of internal public relations to our staff to let them understand. We have um, some alternate stairways that people could use. We normally have those locked on a card reader system. For this project, we took them off card reader, um, or changed the permissions on them to allow staff to use those more regularly. Uh, but for the most part, our staff was, they had two years to prepare for it. And they uh, were pretty good natured about the whole thing. They stayed out of the way when they were supposed to, and they didn't bombard me with too many questions. Nice. No, that's awesome. And again, a uh, pretty significant logistics plan looking at the lobby and all the scaffolding that's in there. And uh, something that you did mention as well, too, I'm glad. I know uh, at the end of the day, it's more money and it's uh, very expensive, but it uh, it sounds like you guys definitely, the, the right decision was made to do it properly because it sounded like the altern alternates was almost a patch or a band-aid opposed to doing it once right and kind of hopefully forgetting about it, not having to worry about it, eliminate the problem. Uh, so that was good to hear. The I want to jump over uh, to Steve and his team. Um, I was just interesting, interested on the uh, decision-making process. Again, with the Navy, was it um, <laughs> were they negotiable on the time frames? Uh, was it same day, or was it more, uh, since it's military, was it very... Uh, like you were talking about the scans, was it very direct on what they wanted and how they want, wanted it? 
they were, this is Ralph Dean again, they were extremely flexible. Uh, the communications were daily. We worked with the Navy architect, um, a guy named David Hopper. I was up on the phone with him. Um, mm -hmm. And he, it, was, it was almost like a round table after every day's investigation and um, then the subsequent recommendations on repair. And very, very unusual. Now, the Navy could do, make those changes on the fly for a couple of reasons. Number one, they believe that. Number two, the original contract award was structured with some unit pricing units. There were unit prices for X number of linear feet of crack repair, X number of test cuts, Y number of linear feet of seam repair on the exterior of the building. And then we didn't use all of that in the construction, and we used, we wound up doing some stuff that wasn't even linear unit price. But at the end of the day, the Navy could move the money around from line item to line item and to what we actually needed to perform on the building. Typically on a federal contract with the Navy, they would make those changes as a contract modification before the new scope of work was initiated. They didn't have time for that on this one. They had to, we had to do it on the fly before the contract was changed. So, and as I said, it, that's, that's a level of trust that you don't see a whole lot out of the federal um, federal client. <laughs> no, I agree. Expression when you said you got uh, submitted the proposal and turned it around the same day, that uh, does not happen often. <laughs> that's true. Yeah. They, had the money in, they had money in hand for this from Navcom Telcom because it was an emergency. So we spent the you know ten days or so to get the pricing right. That's the other advantage of becoming coming to an eight A company, as Evan mentioned. You know, the Navy and the federal government has the latitude to come direct to an eight A up to a certain dollar value based on the client. At the time, Navy could come to CCI with a contract up to five million. Didn't have, we didn't have to compete for it. We just got to agree on a scope and a price and rock and roll. And um, nice. that was the case with this one. That was the case with this one. That's the 8A advantage um, with the federal government. Awesome. No, thank you, guys. I appreciate it, and I appreciate your time. Um, I am looking. I do not see any additional questions uh, for the people on the line, so I'd like to thank, um, obviously, the participants and the panelists for today. I thank you for your time. And again, uh, my name is Andrew Delpreet. I work at Liberty Mutual as a facility manager, and I am co-chair for the IFMA uh, Education Committee. So uh, this webinar was very good and helpful on the other challenges that similar facility managers are probably dealing with. So again, thank you for your time, and um, enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you. Thank you. Take care. Thank you, too.